Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So, um, you just came over from your niece's graduation? Is that, is oh, that what you yeah, said? Oh, yeah, no, I missed all of that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I've, I've been running, I've been dealing with cars all day, man. <laughs> ah. Well, she's, yeah. she's like five, right? Yeah. What's she yeah. graduating from? Kindergarten. Kindergarten graduation, man, that's a big deal. Is she moving to first grade now? Yep. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. Can you imagine that little child in first grade? <laughs> you know, like, okay, I have a hard time believing that your brother is the father of that adorable little girl. <laughs> She's like a genetic anomaly. Yeah. And and now I'm going to find out if he actually listens to the podcast, probably. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, you make a reaction from that one. Well, I assure you he does. <laughs> I don't know. They, so. It seems like they have graduations for everything now. Well, they like, do. Like, you made it to the end of the year. <laughs> Graduation. <laughs> yeah. Like, just yeah. showing up is enough. I guess that's what we've been teaching for a while now, anyway. That's very true. Very true. Oh, and so, I see so you've got ice back in your, your drink. Yeah, I'm, I'm icing it up tonight. So. Yeah, you say tonight. I realized... After yeah. you left last time, when you when you became a big boy and drank it neat, yeah. um, I realized it was because I didn't have any ice, not because you. Oh, I didn't look. I didn't go for ice. Oh yeah. So okay. I'm just saying. No, I would have bitched if they had been there, if I had went for ice and there was none. Oh uh, well, there was no ice, and so I just thought, oh, that's why he drank it without ice. No, nope. because he he didn't have the option. No, I, I took a sip of it neat, and I was like, you know what? I'm going this route tonight. Well. So, good but, for you then but not anyway. tonight <laughs> yeah. that stuff's so good though no i like it i like some rocks on that i like it nice and cold yeah it just I, to me it kills the flavor but i get it you're not the only one yeah. well um in a week and uh, you know i almost feel like i have to apologize for our last podcast like it was not it, it was not up to the standards that i'm hoping that we're setting yeah <laughs> um Really, uh, we were underprepared, and so apologize for that. If you only listen to the last one, you're probably not listening to this one. But if you are, I promise you, it gets better. <laughs> Getting better every day, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so much has happened in the last week, though. There's plenty to talk about tonight. We're we're just we're making war all over the place. Dude, that's crazy, man. I mean, so I guess, first off, we should talk about... I mean, we talked a little bit about it last time, but we didn't have a lot of information in at that right. point. We should talk about the um, the failed coup in Venezuela. Yeah. So, yeah, it like, fell flat on its face failed, from what I understand. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think at the time, I forget exactly what we said about it on the last podcast, but I do think that the indications were on the last podcast that it wasn't going to make it. That it wasn't gonna, mm -hmm. but that was yeah. my prediction is that they they yeah. didn't have the support and yeah. I, I've had time to look around a little bit more and you know they're oh, they keep showing that same image of the, <laughs> um, the well, personnel that, carrier running over this. I didn't realize like, that that image had been flo that that was but that's the only thing that really floated around. Yeah, like well, that's once, because the only once, one that fits the narrative. Once I got to looking, there wasn't a whole lot mm -hmm. else. Out there, yeah, you definitely had to look outside of U.S. news to to, to find get anything. anything. Really? And um, yeah. they, you know, they edited that clip down so much. Like the, yeah. the part that you don't see is the the <clears throat> the people that are getting run over, throwing Molotov cocktails at the <laughs> ABC and yeah. so forth. Like at the point that you're throwing Molotov cocktails at an army vehicle, yeah. you're kind of a combatant. I, I think. Huh. I mean, I, I would agree. I, I think it's fair to say that you are you're not just an innocent bystander. At that <laughs> you're point. not just a protester at yeah, that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but the other thing is that uh, that you couldn't. It was hard to find. But if you went looking enough, you found that they had like the coup crowd yeah. wasn't really that big. I mean, it was it was like tens well, of thousands of people. But and I, I mean. A couple tens of thousands, you know, yeah. probably twenty to thirty thousand people. Yeah, and that's a lot of people. It seems like a lot of people. Seems like. But then, if you looked at the uh, at the gathering that they had outside of the presidential palace, the the pro Maduro, the pro government, yeah. um, anti protest or whatever you want to call it, yeah, it was like a hundred thousand people. <laughs> A lot more people in support of the current government than yeah. against. Seems to be, and then of course now since. Since it failed so completely, um, they are 
talking about sending troops down there again. Yeah. Like, uh, well, we couldn't do it this way. I guess we're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> um, just topple the government. And um, when Pompeo was pressed about it, he, he refused to comment on whether uh, there would be – whether the administration would involve Congress in the decision really? to send I didn't troops hear down that. there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the last thing I heard. And Well, I mean, know. it's not like they would normally – go through congress anyway i mean that's yeah but they're supposed you, to well obviously they're <laughs> supposed to and i mean i guess after 9 11 they made some some kind of attempts to go to congress but they, i mean they still didn't get congress they didn't get what they were supposed to get yeah well i mean they at least got the the authorization for use of military force that they signed to go yeah. pursue the terror war which is probably I, what we're still running off now oh right? yeah absolutely <laughs> the, the aumf from 2002 yeah i actually think it was like updated in 2002 that's yeah. what they're still using to justify all these wars yeah. and when we get around to actually we, we can bring it up now because it's very similar in a lot of ways um, so there's this constitutional qu- question about declaration of war, about whether the president can unilaterally or the executive branch can unilaterally declare war yeah. um, without Congress approval. Yeah. And they're fighting over it with the Yemen thing because you right. know Congress never approved the Yemen war. Of course, they've been funding it all this time, but yeah. um, they never approved it. And so now there's actually been the War Powers Resolution that was signed by both the House and the Senate and ended up on the president's desk, and he vetoed it. Um, yes, he did. So we're still pursuing it. And it's, the, it's the same kind of thing they're, they're doing here. And um, I, I heard an uh, interview. Scott Horton had an interview with... Um, Oh, I can't remember his name. I'm, you know, I'm terrible with names. Yeah. Anyway. One uh, Dave Smith. I heard the one with Dave Smith. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a representative in California. Um, oh, yeah. Co- Coleman? I don't know. Anyway. Don't know. Um, and he was saying that they were trying to pursue it through uh, the Supreme Court at this point for to get the Supreme Court to make a decision on whether the president had the power without Congress under the Constitution to declare war. Yeah. Uh, which obviously... I mean, I would say it's not even a question. Um, I the, would I would say that too, but I'll have to ask the question. Do you think that the Supreme Court will see it that way? Well, I certainly hope so. I mean, I, mean, I hope so too. But if you have realistically a, looking at the bench, well, if you, I, I mean, presumably most of the people on the bench at this point are constitutional, like original interpretation people yeah and if you go with the original ter- interpretation there's no question if you go to the writings of the founding fathers there's no question i mean they were very clear in that the president had the power to wage war once congress had declared war yeah and that they separated the ability to wage war and declare war to make the president not be a king that is essentially the difference between a king and a president oh absolutely um, is that the the king is able to both declare and wage war, whereas the president is only able to wage war once someone else has declared it. Yeah. Um, certainly the way it's supposed to work. Now, there are some people pushing back on the Venezuela thing, uh, including some Republicans. Um, I read an interview with uh, uh, Florida Representative Matt Getz. Gates. Gates. I think it's Gates. Gates. Yeah. Okay. Something tells me it's Gates, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, in the Miami Herald, he said... now. Listen to this closely because there was an interesting bit in here that I want to draw attention to as well. Um, He says, I'm not the only Republican. This is a quote, by the way. Quote, I am not the only Republican urging restraint when it comes to uniformed U.S. military on the ground in Venezuela. End quote. Now, what stood out to you about that? That he's not the only one? No, no. That he, this is the thing that stood out to me, is that he's not the only one urging restraint when it comes to uniformed Oh. military personnel on the ground in Venezuela, really? suggesting that we have, you know, undercover co-ops, co-ops yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. down there probably already, or I'm, that at least he's not opposed to the idea, the idea of, of, it, of yeah. using, you know, spec op groups to, to do hmm. whatever it is. Um, and, so uh, and he also made it clear that he wasn't opposed to military intervention. He just wanted further evaluation about the possible consequences of military <laughs> intervention in Venezuela. Which is just insanity to me. I mean, how many wars do we have to get in before we realize what the consequences are to being involved in these wars? I mean, seriously. You mean like uh, 
trillions of dollars spent in the Middle East over the last 20 years and nothing yeah. to show for and it. And nothing to show for it at all. And I think you can look at Vietnam, too. I mean, really, we should have learned our lesson the first time in Vietnam. We at least had sense enough to get out. Well, and it was because of pressure from the people. Yeah. That we got out of Vietnam. But yeah. nobody seems to care enough. It's it's crazy this. because this is what where we're at now, at least in my mind, is is equally, if not worse, than Vietnam. And there's the the people just aren't as outraged by it. At least not that I can see. Yeah. I mean it's it, but at the same time when Vietnam was going on, we were arguing with communism. That was the big thing, was communism, communism. And now it's terrorism and it's so much easier to make people believe, well, we can't, we got to fight the terrorists. Well, and we, that's the funny thing here. I, I read a, um, a, I don't know if it was a press statement or whatever from the Council on Foreign Relations. Yeah. You're familiar with the Council on Foreign Relations? <laughs> yeah. Man, these people. Anyway, um, they said that we need to to be involved in Venezuela and, and because of the involvement of other people in Venezuela. This concern about terror was exactly what they were focused on. So yeah. they talk about uh, Russian involvement in Venezuela, uh, Cuban involvement in Venezuela, Chinese involvement in Venezuela. These are all things that we know about already, yeah. um, and they're easily explained. Uh, Russia has a large stake in PDVSA, the, the state the oil, oil company, company. Yeah. Um, and uh, they have a bunch of outstanding loans to the Venezuelan government. And yeah. they were invited in by Venezuela. By the current <laughs> government. Yeah. yeah that's which, Legitimate government. Yeah. The elected government yeah. at the very least, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I actually, I heard, speaking of that, I, I know I can't stay focused on it. <laughs> we're all, we're all... really bad about this. But uh, I, I heard an interview with Kevin Zeese. He was talking about that he was one of 150 international observers down there for the elections yeah. last year. Really? And that, wait, last year? Yeah, that's right. Um, last year, and that there, there was no accusation of anything illegitimate about the elections. Yeah. Uh, that Maduro was elected. Yeah. That. Yeah. By the majority of people that voted. That voted. Yeah. yeah. Um, because the the you know the one of opposition, the opposition they protested the vote. Yeah. yeah, and they they didn't participate. Yeah. So, you know, we've been over this before, though. Listen yeah. to, we had an early episode, like our second or third episode was uh, about this. Covered that, yeah. Um, but you asked me at the time if there were international observers, and I said, I assume so, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, now I know well, there now, were. Now that's been solidified. Then. Yeah. So, you know. And I figured that there had been. I mean, I couldn't imagine that there wasn't. Yeah. But who um, knows? So, Russia, large stake in the state oil, yeah. uh, outstanding loans, and they were invited by Venezuela. All right, yeah. by the, the Maduro so, government. So they're welcome. Yeah. Um, China is pretty much the same thing. They're a yeah. huge creditor uh, to Venezuela. They've got a bunch of outstanding loans, and they did this big credit exchange for future oil. Oh, really? Um, so essentially they paid in advance for oil in the future. Yeah. Um, and then they have other like outstanding loans. Which, which makes it – dude, that, that just thought, plottens the – Thickens the plot even more because that's oil we're standing to go steal. Yeah. And if you think that they're just going to stand by and let those if debts go If you think the away, Chinese yeah. are going to be okay with that, mm -hmm. I, I just don't think they will be. Yeah. So um, Cuba, their involvement has been exaggerated a bit as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, they uh, they do provide skilled professionals in exchange for dif discounted oil. Yeah. Um, they've been doing this since the, the since the Chavez government uh, took over. Yeah. Um, so they have people that are trained to do some of the skilled labor stuff uh, involved in the industry and um, you know power production and what have you. So they're sending and they've workers. Been, yeah, they've been sending them over yeah. uh, to help Venezuela out in exchange for a discount on Venezuelan oil. Yeah. Um, Perfectly legitimate. Uh, there, there's no evidence that I could find that they actually have security personnel in Venezuela. Although that's been the big claim of the U.S. government, yeah, <clears throat> is that the um, that the only reason the coup failed is because of all the the Cuban security forces in Venezuela protecting the existing government, yeah. uh, protecting the Maduro government. Um, they actually said that there was like uh, thirty thousand troops. Cuban troops in Venezuela. Okay. Now, just for perspective, the the total military of Cuba is like a hundred thousand troops. 
Oh, yeah. So they're talking about that nearly a third of Cuba's entire military is in yeah. Venezuela. I call malarkey. Yeah. That's just that, 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 not likely. And then they said that Iran and Hezbollah are both in Venezuela. What? and And I can't find any evidence of this. And the people that are making these claims, including the Council of Foreign Relations, didn't provide any evidence. Yeah. Um, no evidence. No, they didn't cite any particular activities that these groups were involved in. It's. <laughs> it's I'm, I'm going to go out on, on a limb here and say it's just a lie. Yeah. Wouldn't it be bad if they were involved too? Like it. It would be <laughs> terrible. Terrible. Now, what would Hezbollah want to do in Venezuela? In Venezuela. Yeah. And truthfully, like Hezbollah, as far as I can tell, um, their big crime, and they did it like violently but their right. big crime was that they defended southern lebanon from idf when israel was trying to expand into lebanon really? as far as i can tell what they did that was so terrible is right. they successfully defended their country against the the israeli defense force trying to expand their borders like they did into gaza and they did into the you know and, and the west bank and the golan heights and and so forth so yeah. um and hezbollah is a is a political organization. Yeah. Like, you know, they were involved in defending their country, but they're primarily a political organization. Like, really? yeah. so anyway, that one's just absurd anyway. Yeah. And speaking of Gaza, as long as we're, <laughs> uh, this is, seems like a good transition. I know we don't have a whole lot of time to spend on Gaza. Yeah. Um, so we're not, uh, I, I will say that we're not directly involved um, but we're certainly involved in in pretty much all Israeli I was military say, activity. I mean, any, anything that Israel's doing, we're pretty well got our hands in. So there was a big flare up over the weekend in Gaza, yeah. um, and uh, like thirty ish people were were killed between rocket fire and um, and rocket fire from the Palestinians and airstrikes from the IDF. Uh, the Israeli Defense Force. I don't know if I clarified that. In case nobody knows what the IDF is. Yeah. Um, so it is the Israeli military. But I, I kept backtracking, right? Like I kept trying to find, you know, the event that triggered the event that triggered the event, you know. Yeah. And th- as near as I can tell, um, this is what happened. So Israeli airstrikes. Well, okay. So let's go ahead and do. T- well, no. Well, I- I'll give you the. The layout of what I can, what I think happened. Here. All right. All right. So there were Israeli airstrikes in response to Palestinian rockets that were fired over the border. Okay. So Israeli airstrikes came in. That's their response to the Palestinian rocket fire. Now, that's pretty much what you hear. Well, is like, it is it the Palestinians constantly just lobbing rockets aimlessly into? Because I, I saw some reports, it's been years ago now. Not that, constantly. It's usually in reaction to something, and it is in this case, too. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the... Well, we'll have to spend a whole podcast talking about the Palestinian situation in Israel. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to go over there, and we definitely don't have time for that tonight. Yeah. Um, so we're going to just try, try and keep it simple. Fair enough. Um, so the Israeli airstrikes were launched in response to... Palestinians firing rockets over the border. But the Palestinians were firing rockets over the border in response to a um, a Hamas uh, manned outpost. Like, it's just an observation post that was shelled by the Israeli Defense Force. Okay. All right. So, but the Israelis were shelling the observation post in response to a Palestinian sniper attack that killed... Uh, and, or I think it killed. Um, but anyway, it was a sniper attack on a IDF uh, officer and soldier that were on patrol near the Gaza border. Really? Okay. But <laughs> the um, the sniper attack on the IDF patrol was in response to an IDF sniper killing a young Palestinian boy who was in the March of Return protest. Um, and that's according to a, a correspondent in Gaza from France 24. Now, that was the only place that I could get that news. But really? um, mostly the way it's being told is that the uh, IDF launched a bunch of airstrikes in response to the Palestinians launching a bunch of rockets. And that's as far back as they go. But like I said, as far as I can tell, as far back as I can track it, um, the actual 
sequence of events was that the IDF killed a young boy with a sniper yeah. um, while he was just participating in the March of Return protest, which is yeah. mostly peaceful. Uh, they've been doing this for a long time. All they want to do is go back to their homes is, is at least the yeah. claim, right? Yeah. So, But the IDF snipes and kills a young boy in the March of Return protest. The Palestinians, in response, um, launch a sniper attack against a patrol on the Gaza border, an IDF patrol on the Gaza border. The uh, IDF responds by shelling an observation post uh, manned by H- Hamas in, in, um, in Gaza. And then the Palestinians respond by launching a bunch of rockets into um, the border areas of Israel. And then the IDF ends it all with a bunch of airstrikes. <laughs> and, and then um, Egypt actually brokered a ceasefire after this few days that this took to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, uh, the ceasefire was brokered by Egypt. Um, it was the, uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad was pressured to accept by Egypt and Hamas. Now, that's an important point also because yeah. Hamas gets blamed for a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But Hamas is a, is a political organization as much as anything at this point as well. Yeah. And Hamas pressured this radical... Um, you know, this is radical Islamic jihad group to accept the ceasefire. Of course, it's all too late, right? Because um, you have four Israelis uh, that died in the rocket fire. Yeah. And um, 25 Palestinians died in the airstrikes. Yeah. Um, and about half of those were civilians, as far as I can tell. Um, the the other half were Islamic jihad and um Hamas people that they were actually targeting, but they're, you know, half of it was collateral damage, including two babies, like one that was like four months and one that was like 14 months and two pregnant women. Wow. Yeah. So this didn't, this didn't really go well. <laughs> yeah. Imagine not. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And all of that, I suppose, brings us to Iran, which is really the big news right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that the, the Venezuela thing connects here too, because this U.S. orchestrated coup in Venezuela, and I'm, I'm just going to say it's U.S. orchestrated. I mean, it, by by all indications that I can see, it has to be. I mean, that's we're the ones leading the charge here. Mm-hmm. Um, this uh, it failed spectacularly. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And so now uh, Guaido's actually calling for U.S. military intervention. Yeah. That would be a bad plan. Like, there's nothing that unites a country quite like having another country come and debate. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, only Americans could believe that that we're a, a, a freeing force mm. when it comes to something like this. I mean, it's, we'll be greeted as liberators. Yeah, I feel like I've heard that before. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so there's there's a question about this, and I think it relates to the Iranian thing. Is yeah. like, what does this mean for U.S. power? That we weren't able to successfully complete a coup in our own hemisphere. Oh, by the way, that's a it's, that's a there's a funny note on that. Yeah, kind of funny. Um, <laughs> Darkly funny. <laughs> yeah. Before we move on, I did catch this interview with uh, with Bolton, um, John Bolton, saying that Russia needs to stay out of our hemisphere. <laughs> and there were a couple of things I thought when I heard that. The first one was I thought. Like, I wonder what Canada thinks of that. Right? Or or Argentina or anybody else when we say our hemisphere. Yeah. Right? But the other thing I thought is, well, what about Ukraine? Yeah. What, and what about Syria us? Yeah. And, and Afghanistan and Yemen and Iran Could and they Iraq not, couldn't, and Libya and yeah. Somalia and Sudan and Mali and Niger. <laughs> Couldn't Russia say the same thing to us? <laughs> yeah. Like, Except the rules don't apply to us. That's, that's how we act. Yeah. I think that we really believe that. Um, yeah. Not we, but... The... U.S. government. Yeah. Um, the, the power brokers, as it were. Yeah. So, uh, this all kind of started a few days ago. Um, the U.S. deployed a carrier strike force... Uh, and a bomber task force on allegations from Mossad. That's the Israeli intelligence agency. Um, Well, 
According to the Israeli media, Mossad told the U.S. that they had intelligence that Iran was planning a non-specific <laughs> attack on U.S. forces in Iraq. Yeah. Um, now, the what we're saying is that we deployed this carrier strike force in response to that, but the, the carrier group was actually deployed April 1st, like well before... That had happened. Yeah. Um, so it, they may have changed their plans somewhat or whatever, but they were already on the move towards the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and and Bolton threatened Iran with uh, unrelenting force um, in response to any attack on U.S. interests or allies, like, in the Middle East. Yeah. All right, so now Iran's responsible for anything anybody does, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Now we know that Bolton's been after Iran for a long time. Like long he's time. he's wanted war with Iran for decades now. Mm-hmm. This right? this so, is this is his war. Yeah. This is the at one. least since the Reagan era, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so th- the other interesting note on the carrier strike force and the bomber group is that these are offensive forces. Yeah. So presumably we're responding to deter Iran. Yeah. But we're not sending defensive forces. We're sending offensive forces. <laughs> um, and then I, I came across an article that had uh, a comment from an, an anonymous official. So, you know, take yeah. what you will from that. But um, that the the threat, like with a little bit of detail on the threat, that the threat was through some proxy force, uh, like uh, troops in Iraq, um, like U.S. troops killed in Iraq, uh, by militants from 2008 to 2011 um, is what they were saying. It's it's similar to that. But the the U.S. was fighting on the side of the Shia, yeah. which Iran is on the side of the Shia in Iraq. <laughs> and so it, the, the U.S. forces killed in Iraq between 2008 and 2011 were probably not killed by Iranian-backed forces because... Iran was more than happy to let us kill all the Sunnis that we wanted. Yeah, that's that's their enemy. Yeah. Right. And, you know, of course, then we went to war with Syria where we were back in the Sunnis. Yeah. Um, and we're in war in Yemen where we're back in the Sunnis, yeah. uh, including AQAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We are supporting them in a war against the, the Houthis <laughs> in Yemen. This is also an important point, I think, but it's not related to what... I mean, it's only loosely related to what we're talking about now. Yeah. So you actually had, though, while we were engaged in Syria and we've been engaged in Iraq, where the people that are our allies on the Syrian side of the border are our enemies on the Iraqi side of the border. Yeah. Same groups of people. Yeah, yeah. All, we're right. just All they had to do was cross borders and they would get weapons from us instead of being fired at by us. Yeah. And it's it's unreal well, that this can happen. I I'll tell just... I'll tell you something too. I remember when we went into Iraq initially, the people who were against that war at the time were telling us that in Iraq there's many factions of of people. And that that Saddam Hussein kept all of those factions under control. He and, and nobody. I mean, you can argue with the way he did it. I yeah. mean, obviously, it wasn't the. I'm not a big fan of his. Not exactly a big fan of his, but mm-hmm. he kept the country under control. And and anybody that was against the war at the time said, when when we take down Saddam Hussein, it's going to be chaos. That all of these groups are going to fight with each other, and it's going to be a mess. Yeah, and same thing with Qaddafi. And it's not going to be anything that we can just unwind. Mm-hmm. And that kind of goes back to what you're saying with all of these groups, where we're literally funding them in one country and fighting them in another, because we don't really have a dog in this hunt as far as which group it is. We just want our ends met. Yeah. Um, but we can't seem to figure out what those are, and that's kind of a problem. Well, like, who who is it that we want to come out on top? And I guess the yeah. answer is nobody. So we just create chaos. So we just going. we're just so and we're sell literally a bunch of we're literally just selling weapons and creating chaos. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I find it interesting that the the concern was that there was a threat to U.S. forces in Iraq, but immediately after this threat was announced, Pompeo visited Iraq. <laughs> he wasn't scared. Yeah, and I'm thinking he wasn't scared because 
there wasn't a credible threat. Yeah. Like there wasn't. Really I imagine a he wouldn't be just going into mm. something like that. But who knows? Maybe he's a brave man. Maybe. Well, he also he is. I would say he is a brave man because then he said, then he said this, and anybody who actually keeps any track of what's going on over there knows that this is just yeah. bull. Right. I mean, he said, and this is a quote also, right. um, quote, this would be a threat to take American forces out that continue our com- campaign against ISIS, end quote. Yeah. Um, once again, Iran is one of the reasons that ISIS has been defeated in the Middle East. Yeah. Iran was working with Syria in Syria to take out ISIS forces. Again, right. ISIS, Sunni jihadists, yeah. not on the side of Iran. Yeah. <laughs> Iran is not going to interfere with US fighting ISIS. Yeah. They want it's, us to. It's in, in their fact, interest, yeah. They've been cooperating with us. They've been yeah. working with US military to fight ISIS for years. Yeah. So the whole thing is just a lie. It's just a lie. And it's yeah. dependent on this assumption that you don't know any better. Yeah. Well, and your average person though, I mean I'll and I'll be the first to tell you, like, I don't know the different factions over there. Like I couldn't tell you. But it's it's a really complicated deal, you know. We, but there's a really there's a really simple answer though. Mm-hmm. Just pull everybody back. There's, yeah, we get out of it. It's not our we, problem. It's really not our problem. Mm-hmm. And focus on Venezuela. We need war with Venezuela. Right. right. <laughs> we, need to, we need to keep people out of our hemisphere. Oh yeah, right. That's that's where the real war is at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it's true though. Like we. Us being over there creates more terrorists than it would we would ever. We've created more terrorists fighting this war than we will ever mm-hmm. kill. Yeah, uh, the Taliban controls more of Afghanistan now than they did when we started a war in Afghanistan. Exactly. I mean, it, it's just it makes no sense. It's you're shooting yourself in the foot. And again, here's another one of those things where there's a difference. Yeah. Like there's a difference between the Taliban and yeah. Al Qaeda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the difference They're, between the mafia and the government. Yeah, I mean, that really, well, yeah, that's yeah. that's really the difference. The Taliban, they may be cruel and authoritarian, but they're a government organization. Yeah. Al-Qaeda is a bunch of gangsters. Yeah. There's a difference. They're one of them that's is the That's trying law, to one become them, the government. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how it works here. You know, Dave Smith uh, always says that the um, the government is just a... Uh, a mafia masquerading as a human rights organization. I think that that's a great description. Uh, it absolutely is. Yeah. Um, so we we've had all of this, all these little lies. Let's and you know we keep. It's the same thing in Yemen. They had these hearings. They they have uh, defense department people up there saying, "Well, we're waging this war in Yemen against the Houthis because." We want to make sure that ISIS and Al Qaeda don't get a foothold. Well, but the Houthi are fighting ISIS and Al Qaeda again. There's a difference between the Sunni group, and I think the Houthi are actually like Zahidi or something yeah. Muslims, but um, Iranian backed, Shia backed, yeah. uh, and so we we're fighting with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Those are the Sunni groups, and you, uh, the United Arab Emirates, is actually like hiring. AQAP militants into their army. We we are literally fighting and providing air support for AQAP in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but again, we're getting. I could, I could complain yeah. about this stuff all night. <laughs> like, learn who's on whose side. Yeah. This is why. Uh, this is why Tulsi Gabbard is such an interesting candidate. By the way, is because she knows who's she on. She actually side. understands the stuff. Yeah. And when one of these guys attacks her and says something like, "Well, we got to be in Yemen because we got to fight off the Al Qaeda terrorists and the ISIS guys," and she said, "Well, but why are, then are we giving them weapons and fighting the other guys?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, anyway, which is this, another reason why she will get no coverage. She, I know. Her campaign is going nowhere. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I just want her to get into the debates. I'm going to contribute to her campaign. I think just so that she can meet the threshold to be in the debates. It'd be interesting to have her there. Um, so you know, this is all moving towards then Iran saying exactly one year to the day since the U.S. left the Iran nuclear deal. And by the way, I think this is one of the few things that Obama did right yeah. during his presidency, um, no, was to sign the Iran nuclear deal. I do think that it made the world a safer place, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, but 
one year to the day, and this is clearly a, a, a message that's being sent from the U.S. leaving the the nuclear deal. Um, they have announced that they are going to um, what is it? They're they're going to start ignoring some of the the parts of the nuclear deal. Well, is how it's being? What? Well, yeah, it's told. the way that's the way it's being played up in the media. And the the idea is is so since we've backed out of this deal, they're not getting the full benefits of being in the deal because there were certain thresholds for their economic growth and stuff mm-hmm. that we were contributing to. And without having us in the deal and having us actively opposing the deal, because we're punishing any companies that do business with Iran, yeah. whether no matter what country they're in it's either, you pretty well have a choice you can do business with iran and that's all you get mm-hmm. or you can do business with the u.s with the rest of the world with the rest of the world yeah, yeah. so that's but that's their complaint is yeah. we're not seeing the benefits of being in this deal so if 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 something doesn't change we're going to start producing uranium again and doing mm-hmm. the whole and at least that's how it's portrayed in the media. Yeah, is that that if if we're not if we don't see the benefits, then we're going to start building a bomb again, basically. Yeah, which they were never doing anyway. Yeah. Um. And so the they essentially they said Iran, Iran who's been fully compliant with the deal even after we left. They have. Yeah. Um. They said that they'll stop complying with some commitments made beyond the agreement. And that they are urging the other member nation, nations, which includes um, Russia, UK, France, Germany, uh, to protect them from U.S. sanctions, which they've tried to do. Yeah. Um, and then as a response to them saying that they're going to leave these commitments and this kind of media coverage that you were talking about, that they're abandoning the deal and what have you. Yeah. Um, then uh, we're we're talking about war with Iran again. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually I want to read this whole article that uh, Jason Ditz wrote on antiwar.com because this is interesting. Um, I, and I think that he he summarizes this better than I can off the top of my head like I'm doing <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, So the the title is uh, Trump inches towards attacking attacking Iran. U.S. warships bombers scramble to region as U.S. threats grow. The Trump administration is scrambling to deploy troops, warships, and bombers into the Middle East this week, with top officials talking up the possibility of attacking Iran, and analysts saying the U.S. appears closer to such a war than any time since Trump took office. As ever, the U.S. is inching towards a war by taking hostile actions against Iran, and then convincing themselves that Iranian retaliation could be imminent. Israeli intelligence has only added to that perception, unsurprising since the Netanyahu government has sought a U.S.-Iran war for years. This has been a steady buildup of tension entirely of America's making, with the U.S. taking a unilateral action, like declaring the Iranian Revolutionary Guard to be terrorists, then predicting Iranian retaliation, then talking themselves into more hostile unilateral actions to preempt something they only imagined Iran was going to do. Among administration hawks, these actions make total sense, both because they're hostile to Iran in the first place and because they assume Iran will react the same way they would, recklessly and ignoring the consequences. Even among analysts trying to give the U.S. more credit, the concern is that the constant U.S. brinksmanship, spun as, quote, maximum pressure, end quote, on Iran, is going to blunder the U.S. into a war that they don't really want, but which the administration can't seem to help itself but to instigate. Hmm. And I, I think that that's it. The, like this whole talk about the Iranians breaking this commitment, this is what's actually what they're actually saying that they're going to do. Yeah. Um, they're going to stop limiting their stockpiles of low enriched uranium, and they're going to stop limiting their stockpiles of heavy water. Yeah. Uh, both of these limitations were allowed to be dropped if any signatories to the deal, like this is within the deal. Yeah. If any signatories to the deal abandon the deal, like the U.S. did a year, like ago. we did, yeah. And they're doing this in order to maintain production of their civilian nuclear energy program. Yeah. All right. That's why they need to increase stockpiles is because now they're isolated from the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, and, and Well, I'll tell you, you won't hear that on the media at all. I mean, they're not – there's – like I say, that's, that's not what the talk is, at least not on the, the, the venues I watch. 
No, I know. And we're just imposing greater sanctions and we're doing our best to prevent any other country from dealing. We're threatening yeah. other countries oh, yeah. with sanctions if they continue to deal with Iran. Now, we, that I did see coverage of because because that's what we're doing. Like, yeah. I mean, if you do business with Iran, that's all you get. Well, and I, I saw on France 24 this morning, uh, Macron was saying we would like to continue to work with Iran and trade with Iran and work around the sanctions that the U.S. has imposed. But the U.S. has threatened all the banks, businesses, and governments with yep. sanctions if they if they continue to deal with Iran. Exactly. And that the U.S. is just too powerful a, a global economic force to, to go up against like it that. It is. The U.S. government is literally waging economic warfare against the entire rest of the world. Yeah. Over Iran, by the way. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean... Who's really no threat to us. Who is... Yeah, absolutely. They uh, they haven't been responsible for any military action outside of their region, no. you know, their hemisphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that we're in like a... Oopsie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to have to do something about that. Yeah, my language is off. That's all right. Uh, I'll finally record that little cover-up for cursing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the situation that we're in now, and... I don't understand why we're doing this. And this actually is far worse for us in the long run, oh. from my perspective. I mean, it seems to me that this this is what creates isolationism and yeah. unwanted isolationism. Because if we threaten the whole rest of the world, it doesn't matter how powerful we are. So at some point, some of these countries are going to go, you know what? I think we might be better off just allying with each other and forgetting the U.S. Yeah, We'll do our own thing. Yeah. I mean... We'll lose some of our uh, some of our goods or whatever. Like, imagine being isolated from China. Like, we're trying to do apparently there too, uh, like adding all these extra tariffs and so forth. Oh yeah. my God! Heaven forbid they send us cheap goods. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, but this is one of those situations, and this is why I think it relates to the failed Venezuelan coup. Yeah. Because it's like a crack in the armor, right? Yeah. That we haven't we haven't been able to control the the political situation in a country right near us yeah <laughs> and so how is it that at some point people are going to start asking the question well if they can't even control the political situation in a in a failing country like venezuela failing yes then why are we letting them control the political situation here in france or the uk or germany or russia or iran yeah which goes back to the whole we shouldn't be trying to control them anyway well absolutely you yeah, know absolutely um, and I, I think that this is just a bad move for us all in all. And and here's the thing about why the Iranian nuclear deal was made the world a safer place. It made the world a safer place from the United States. Yeah. Well, it, it yeah, it, it kind of it settled everything down. It kind of eased the tensions. Yeah. It took away our excuse for war. Yeah. Um, we can no longer claim with the uh, UN inspectors and all these people going in and checking over and over and over again yeah. and verifying that, yes, Iran does not have a military nuclear program. Yeah. They're not pursuing the bomb. Yeah. They have a civilian program. They're sticking within the deal. Yeah. And what that did was that took away any excuse we had to go into Iran yeah. because the excuse that we have is that they're, they're building a bomb, that they could become a nuclear threat, bless you. Um, that they could become a nuclear threat and we have to prevent that. We have to preempt that. Yeah. And so it took away that excuse. <laughs> and then, bless you. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, it took away that excuse and so it made the world a safer place from the United States. Yeah. Iran was never actually, they weren't a threat. actively pursuing a military nuclear program anyway. Yeah. They were looking into the possibility of developing military nuclear program when they were at war with Iraq. Yeah. Um, back in the 90s. But we took care of that problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. <laughs> so then they abandoned pursuit back then. Yeah. Um, and and it's been verified repeatedly. Yeah. They aren't doing what we're claiming that we're doing. And then here's the, the irony of the whole thing is that then we leave this nuclear deal and immediately start saying, oh my goodness, they're breaking the deal now. <laughs> They're a nuclear threat. We better go in there and do something the about it. The deal we're not even a part of anymore. Right. Yeah. Because we chose to leave. Yeah. Because Trump chose to leave. Because Trump chose to leave. And they have continued to abide by the deal. Yeah. Because they're still in the deal with five other countries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. But the but the deal's for like I say other countries, I guess. Anyway. The deal's not paying off the way for Iran the way it's supposed to because without us with us actively undermining it, they just can't get the the benefit from it that they may need. Yeah. Well, I don't know where to go from there. I think that we've covered this, hopefully. Uh, Iran, Shia. Yeah. Saudi Arabia, Sunni. I have to write that down. Yeah, that's, that's an important <laughs> that's an important one to remember. Important distinction there. Yeah. Um, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Taliban. Political organizations. Yeah. Al-Qaeda. Gangsters. Gangsters. They're the mob. Yeah, they're the mob. Uh, I don't know. Um, we get on the phone with your your congressman. They do listen if you call enough. Yeah. Um, well, they sort of listen. My congressman tells me he respectfully disagrees with me over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm gonna keep irritating him. Might as well. Yeah. Well, I got nothing else to do. Right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, I I hope that, <laughs> I hope that we'll get it right next time. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, try to stay free. And uh, remember to follow us on Facebook. Share. Um, follow us on iTunes. Share. Yeah. Uh, is that it? I think that's pretty well done. Okay. Well, then, uh, ciao. Later.